Question for you, what is the difference between AM and FM radio? Well, AM stands for amplitude modulation and FM stands for frequency modulation. But beyond the words, what does it actually mean? Well, AM, amplitude modulation, is represented in the top graph here. What it means is when I speak into the microphone and it's sent out into the air as an electromagnetic wave, the information is actually carried by changing the amplitude. The amplitude is the height of the wave. So you see how the wave is taller here, but shorter here and taller here and so on and so forth? So as I speak louder and more softly, that information is going out into the air as an electromagnetic wave carried by the changes in the amplitude in corresponding lockstep with the changes in my voice. Now, frequency modulation actually sounds a lot better for reasons we'll talk about, but it's basically carrying the information in, not in the changes of the amplitude. Notice the wave is the same height all the time, but in frequency modulation, the frequency changes. So here we have a low frequency, and over here we have a higher frequency, and it gets a little bit more to a lower frequency. So in the amplitude AM case, when I talk louder, louder, quieter, quieter, it changes the height of the wave, but in FM, as I talk louder, louder, quieter, quieter to quieter, it slightly shifts the frequency uh, in, in time in lockstep with the actual voice you're trying to transmit, and that's how it's transmitted and the information is carried differently. Now, what are the main differences? Well, AM radio can actually travel farther for reasons I'll talk about in a second, but it's much more susceptible to noise, so it doesn't sound as crisp or as nice. FM sounds a lot better, but it can only transmit for shorter distances, maybe 50 miles or so, whereas AM can go for 100 or 200 miles, and at nighttime, it can actually uh, very effectively bounce off of the ionosphere. The AM frequencies are low enough to be able to do that, so they can go up to maybe 1,000 miles. And basically, there's a plasma layer called the ionosphere above the uh, atmosphere there, and that plasma reflects the low frequencies better than it reflects the high frequencies which pass through. Now, if you ever listen to AM radio, it just doesn't sound as good, especially like in a thunderstorm. You'll hear lots of uh, interference and noise. And that's because any electrical interference there, like a thunder or, or a, a lightning strike or something like this, will uh, produce electrical noise that will directly make the amplitude change on the carrier wave. And you'll hear that in your speakers. And so because FM doesn't operate that way, it's not so susceptible to that. Also, because the AM can reflect off the ionosphere, it's a lot more susceptible to multipath interference, which you hear is that weird sound in AM. Now, everybody's heard of quantum mechanics or quantum theory or quantum physics. But what I want to do today is take a few minutes to try to talk about the core ideas of this theory, what sets it apart from regular physics, and what makes it so weird. Now, in our everyday experience growing up, we deal with baseballs and footballs and automobiles and airplanes and houses, very, very large objects. Even the smallest object that you've ever had has held trillions of trillions and trillions of these things that we call atoms. So our everyday experience with how these objects behave is basically how they behave when there's trillions of them next to each other. But when you zoom in at the microscopic level, at the quantum level, then what you have is a situation where the behavior begins to differ from what we see in everyday situations to how individual atoms and individual electrons behave, and that's quantum mechanics. Now, probably the number one thing that sets quantum mechanics apart is that every piece of matter, whether it's an atom or an electron or a neutron, and also every piece of light, like a photon, a quantum of light, something like this, they all have what's called wave-particle duality. They have aspects of a wave-like nature and aspects of a particle-like nature at the same time. Now, in the early days, people knew that light had a wave-like nature because what they would do is they would take the light, they would run it through a prism, and then they would split it into the rainbow, and they would take the colors and they would smash them into each other, and they could see that the crest and the troughs would line up and either cancel or reinforce each other, producing these interference patterns. And so we know that interference patterns come along with the nature of light. So we know from a long time ago that light has a wave-like character. And at the same time, we started doing chemistry experiments and figured out that everything is made of atoms, which looked very particle-like because we could do experiments where we could throw these electrons or protons at various targets and we could see their particle nature. But then something weird happened. We started doing experiments with light 
where we could see that light only comes in discrete chunks, quantized chunks of energy like a particle. And we could also do experiments with electrons and other bits of matter showing that they can interfere in ways that we thought that only uh, applies to light. So we could see the wave-like nature of matter and we could also see the particle-like nature of light. And then once the full quantum theory was born to explain all of this, we realized that all of these phenomena are governed by probabilities, which is the biggest departure from everyday experience. In the quantum realm, everything is governed by probabilities. Now here's a question for you. If you're standing on the equator and you weigh X number of pounds of weight, and then you move to the North Pole and you stand up here at the North Pole and weigh yourself again, would you have exactly the same weight or would you weigh slightly different if you're on the equator versus the pole? Now the answer to this is yes, you actually would measure and you would actually have a different weight on the equator versus the pole. And to understand why, we have to talk about the rotation of the Earth. Now there's two main reasons for this. Now we think of the Earth as this perfect sphere, but actually as it's rotating, it's slightly bulged in the center, in the mid area here, as compared to the uh, top there, the poles. So actually the farther away you are at the equator from the center of the Earth, because it's bulging, is one of the reasons why you're going to weigh less there. The other reason is due to the forces because of the rotation of the planet. Now we don't feel it, but the Earth is actually at the equator rotating tangentially at about a thousand miles per hour. That's really, really fast. But notice that that speed is maximum if you're standing on the equator. As you move more and more and more and more north, all the way up to the North Pole, eventually if you're standing right here on the North Pole and the Earth is rotating, you would just be kind of looking up at the sky, rotating in a tiny circle around your feet, and you wouldn't be really moving very fast, just a pure rotation about your axis. So maximum speed at the equator and zero speed, tangential speed, standing on the North Pole. So as we're riding around on the surface of the planet at the equator at a thousand miles an hour, we have a constant tendency to want to travel in a straight line away from the surface of the planet. That's the law of inertia. And so what that means is we're tending to be flung away from the planet all the time. Now this tendency to be flung away from the planet shows up as what's called a fictitious force called the centrifugal force. It's not a real force, it's just the tendency of everything to travel in a straight line away from the surface of the planet trying to be flung away. It's highest at the equator because the rotational speed is highest at the equator and it's zero at the poles of the planet. Now this counteracting force opposite of gravity tends to make you feel lighter at the equator. So a 200 pound person measuring their weight at the poles would actually be about 5% lighter or about 199 pounds at the equator. Let me share with you the number one math skill that you will use in everyday life. The most useful thing that I know about math. And that's how to rapidly calculate percentages in your mind. You use it when you're at the restaurant for a tip. You use it if you're paying sales tax on a vehicle or a grocery bill or anything else. You use it all the time to estimate things. I'm going to show you how to do it in your mind. So first you have to start with being able to calculate 10% of anything. 10% is super easy. If you have, for instance, a $80 bill and you wanna know what 10% of 80 is, all you do is you take that decimal point, which is after the zero in the 80 and you move it uh, to the left. And so that means 10% of 80 is eight. So 10% of $80 is $8. What about something like 30? $30, what's 10% of that? You just move that decimal point, or 10% of 30 is $3. And it also works with uh, other decimals as well. What about $2.50? You take that decimal, move it one spot to the left, and that's 0.25 or 25 cents is 10% of $2.50. All right, now here's where it gets useful. Let's say you have to calculate a 20% tip, but the bill is $40. So you don't calculate 20%, first you calculate 10%, and then you double it. That would be the 20%. That's how percentages work. So let's say the bill was $40. 10% you rapidly do and say, well, that's $4. 10% of 40 is $4. But I want a 20% tip, so I double it. So that's $8. So 20% of $40 is eight, and that's the amount of tip that you give. 
But let's say you want to give a 15% tip instead of a 20% tip. What do you do? First, go back and calculate 10%. So if your bill was, let's say, $60, 10% is $6. But 20%, doubling it, would be $12. And so somewhere between $6 and $12, that's going to be $9. So that's going to be a 15% tip on a $60 bill. This also goes for sales tax. You can estimate. Sales tax for me is about 8.25%. That's difficult to calculate, but it's pretty close to right between 5 and 10%. So let's say your bill was $20. 10% uh, of that is going to be $2, and 5% is going to be $1. And right in the middle is going to be $1.50. That's going to be pretty close as an estimate to your tax. Now here's a question for you. Why does a helium balloon like these float up into the air, whereas a regular balloon made of the same rubber filled with air sinks? And the same question applies to a hot air balloon. Why exactly does it float up in the sky? Well, the reason that's always given for this, and the most basic reason, is you're taught that the density of helium, the gas called helium, is actually lower than the density of the air. And you're taught in science that when you have the density of a gas lower than the surrounding gas, it tends to float. But seriously, that doesn't really drive down to the fundamental reason. That's just a rule I'm giving you. Why is it that density of gases in kilogram per cubic meter, when it's less than the surrounding gas, why does that actually make it float? Where does the force come from? And it's the same exact thing for a hot air balloon. The air inside of this balloon is heated. So when things get heated, they tend to expand. So they have a lower density. So the same thing, when you heat this air, the density of the air inside that balloon is less than the density of the air just surrounding the balloon. Again, providing an upward force. But why does that happen? So we can go one level deeper. You're also taught, when you get into physics class, that the buoyant force that happens on this object in a, a surrounding fluid of air is an upward force. And that upward force is equal to the weight of the air that is displaced by this volume. So this balloon has a certain volume. It is pushing the surrounding air out of this space where the balloon is. And the weight of the air that is pushed out of the way, uh, out of the way is actually equal to the upward force on on this balloon. It's called the buoyant force. It's the same force you feel when you go swimming and you go underwater. You feel lighter because you're displacing the water and the weight of the water that is actually being displaced is equal to the upward force there. So the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid that is displaced. But again, why? That doesn't explain anything. Let's talk about why. Here's the reason why. We live in this fluid called the atmosphere. It extends for hundreds of miles above us. And the atmosphere has a weight to it. All gases do. And they're pushing down toward the ground. So there's like a column of air with a weight. And on the top of this balloon is closer to space than the bottom of this balloon. So the weight of the atmosphere at the top here is slightly different than the weight of the atmosphere at the bottom because there's more air from the bottom all the way up into space. So basically, there's a pressure difference from the top to the bottom of the balloon because the amount of atmosphere all the way up to space is different. And that difference in pressure pushes up on the bottom of the balloon, and that's where the buoyant force comes from. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.